to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation as usual as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about everyone and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host Lori LeBay and I'm thrilled you could join us today. If you liked our opening music it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band and you can uh, download that on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to our show Alzheimer Speaks is about sound information not just sound bites. So maybe, just maybe you can be our next guest. Now I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce our guests here. First, I want to remind you all to go check out Dementia Map. It's our global resource directory and we would love you to explore that. Maybe you have a service product or tool you would like entered. Uh, That is easily done. And I would personally love to give you a tour of that site if you would like. Just reach out to me at radio at Alzheimer Speaks. Dot com. Now, there are a couple of um, support groups I want to mention. One is a memory cafe. We hold it the second and the fourth Wednesday of each month. It's called Arthur's Memory Cafe, and it is sponsored by Arthur's Senior Care. And uh, you can find information on that on our main website, as well as a Caregiver Connect, which is an in-person meeting for families dealing with dementia, which is sponsored by Brookdale North Oaks. We meet the last Wednesday of each month at 10 o'clock in person here in Shoreview, Minnesota. So again, just uh, reach out to me for more information on that. And then I wanna let you know about an important research program for Alzheimer's that you can participate in. It's called Picnic Health and you can do it from home. Just go to picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and sign up and you'll get $25. Picnic Health collects and digitizes all of your medical records into one online account. And then you can consent to share anonymized data of your records with medical researchers. By examining this real world data from medical records, researchers can find the answers that can't be found in clinical trials. So there's important information that each person has in their unique healthcare journey. So please share your story. And if you care for someone with Alzheimer's disease, you can sign up on their behalf as long as you have legal consent and manage their medical records in the Picnic Health account. Again, learn more by going to picnichealth.com forward slash speaks and get your $25 when you sign up today. We're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker and we will be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Okay, it is time to introduce our guest today, and I'm so excited. We are going to be talking with Daniel George and Dr. Peter Whitehouse, who are the co-authors of The American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society, which was just published by John Hopkins University Press and is now available on Amazon. Peter is a professor of neurology at Case Western Reserve University and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Daniel is a medical anthropologist 
and an associate professor in the Department of Humanities and the Department of Public Health Sciences at Penn State College of Medicine. Now, I also want to introduce you to Elon Caspi. He is a cohort of mine. Uh, he co-facilitates Dementia Chats, which is a webinar series that we do uh, where the true experts speak. And we listen to their voice. And of course, those are, are people living with dementia. He is a dementia behavioral specialist, and he has his brand new book out as well. Well, I am so thrilled to have you all with me today because this is going to be a fascinating conversation because I truly do believe dementia is in crisis. I mean, the whole world's in crisis on many levels and you throw dementia in there, it gets really, really confusing. And, you know, your, your book here, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society, I think this is going to be just a wonderful conversation that we have today. But before I, I get into my line of questioning, I always like to ask everybody just for a little background on themselves in terms of have you been touched personally by dementia? And so, Peter, I'm going to have you go first, if you don't mind. So I just wrote a piece about my 50 years in the, in the field. Uh, which starts with my grandmother. Um, I can't say I was a primary caregiver. I was away in college from about to start medical school. And uh, now uh, in the later uh, parts of my career, my uh, father-in-law just died a couple of days ago. Um, we um, helped them move up from Florida to, to be here in Cleveland with us and um, hopefully contributed to some last minute uh, uh, opportunities for enjoying life. Uh, before, um, unfortunately, he he passed. Um, so yes, uh, and I would say also, I've, I've known lots of other folks in the dementia advocacy space. Um, there's a whole vast reimagining dementia group that's operating now. So yeah, I think it's very important you ask that question, and I thank you for doing so. Great, thank you. Daniel, can you give us a little background if you've been personally touched? Yes, yeah, so when I was in high school growing up in Cleveland, I used to volunteer at an adult daycare facility, and I uh, remember meeting this gentleman named Mr. Earl, and uh, he was an um, African-American gentleman in his 80s who had fairly advanced dementia, and he would never want to play like balloon volleyball or the other kind of frivolous games that were going on in his opinion. So I would sometimes just sit with him, and he would tell me the same story over and over again about how he grew up uh, on a, as a sharecropper with his family on the farm where um, the film Gone with the Wind, where footage was taken. And he was very proud of that. And um, it, it sort of anchored our relationship. And he would tell me that every time. And I loved the story every time. And it just struck me at that moment how powerful um, you know, story and narrative and caring for people um, uh, compassionately and just listening and being in the moment with them was. Uh, but I was personally touched in my family in my mid-20s. I had a great aunt who had dementia. And I um, was uh, kind of thrust into a caregiver role for a few weeks. Uh, before we were able to get in-home care. And it just absolutely um, concretized how difficult things can be for caregivers. Uh, she changed very much. She was a very serious Christian woman um, and she became very um, witty and spontaneous and whimsical. And it was a very um, interesting evolution in my relationship with her, um, but it had its difficult moments for sure. So um, that's, that's sort of my background. And I'll just echo Peter by thanking you for uh, starting us off on that question. Right. And Elon, I'm going to have you go ahead since you're co-hosting with me and just give a little background on yourself and everyone will have an idea of, of the four of us and how we uh, merge together on this topic. I've been in the aging field for 27 years, started as a nurse aide in a nursing home where my grandfather lived. And both of my grandmothers had dementia. And since then, I've worked as a social worker in a nursing home. I did applied research um, recent years on, on various forms of elder mistreatment in long-term care homes. Um, and I do a lot of education and advocacy related to elders, human rights of elders, safety, people with dementia, dignity. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place. Right. And for people who don't know me, my mom had dementia for 30 years. And boy, if that's not life-changing, I don't know what is. So here I am in this industry trying to make a difference. So let's start out first with why the heck did you guys decide to write this book? And, and the title that you picked is very strong. 
Um, and I think for a lot of people is going to just kind of make their head cock go, what's this all about? So Daniel, I'll let you take that first, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so we have a track record of writing books with provocative titles. In 2008, we wrote a book called The Myth of Alzheimer's, which uh, made some waves as well. Um, but of course, the year after that book came out, we had the Great Recession. Um, and I think all of us were sort of forced into this realization that our lives are inherently political now, and it's impossible to ignore issues of political, of political economy, even in the dementia care field. And so um, in 2016, specifically November, everybody will remember the election that we had that year and the tumult in the culture. Um, but some significant things happened in that month, you know, with the backdrop of the Great Recession. And that was uh, the drug solanuzumab, which was an anti-amyloid antibody, failed in its phase three clinical trials. It had been really hyped up uh, for years and uh, the, unfortunately it was unsuccessful. However, in the same month, there was a study that came out in JAMA uh, by our colleague Ken Langa at Michigan showing decreasing dementia rates in the United States. And so there was a paradox there, right? Biotechnology fails yet again, and yet Alzheimer's and dementia rates appear to be dropping in the United States. And from that paradox emerged our thinking about this book, uh, which sort of has forced us to think about the reasons why dementia rates are falling, not just in the United States, but in Canada and other Western European countries. And when you start thinking about that and looking backwards, uh, you know, you're inevitably thrust into um, confronting political economy and how things were structured in the 20th century and affect that ahead on brain health. Uh, and so our American dementia is effectively referencing the fact that we've lost sight. We've forgotten a lot of the lessons that made life better in the 20th century. And of course, another aspect of dementia is not being able to project forward. Uh, and we're not doing a very good job of that right now, as you said. Hey, Lori, with crises sort of swirling around us every day. So that's sort of the, the brief background of the book. Okay, great. Peter, anything you want to add to that on your book, again, called American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society? Well, two things. First, I had so much fun writing the first book with Danny, I decided we'd have to do a second one. <laughs> Uh, the other is, um, yeah, we're, we're talking to all our colleagues around the world and they're saying American dementia, you know, what's that? Uh, and uh, it is exactly what Danny said. It's a cultural critique. Uh, it says we are thinking, we're remembering badly, we're thinking about the future badly, we're not doing very well with our activities of daily living as a a society as, as, as a species. And so we're trying to use um, the concept of dementia and the importance of going from crisis to comfort in dementia, which you emphasize in your program, as something we really need to think about for its consequences on health in general and society in general. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that, and, and, and I kid my colleagues in, in uh, Canada, well, we, we, you have mild cognitive impairment of the North American type and watch it, you know, you may be on their way to American dementia. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Peter, I'm gonna throw this one to you first uh, since we were still talking. I think this is a really important question and that is what are the consequences of being on this race for the, the bullet, the, the magic bullet to fix dementia with drugs? Well, I have been in the field a long time. I was uh, I worked with the FDA inter and international regulatory bodies when we approved the first uh, set of medications, uh, which didn't prove to be as effective as we want, but it was a much better process than this absolutely awful approval of aducanumab or aducanumab as it's known. Um, this is a crisis for the field because I don't know if there could have been anything more wrong with this approval. Uh, by that, I mean, um, they used a mechanism that they kind of hid away from um, the advisory panel that voted unanimously without knowing that they were going to approve it with an accelerated mechanism. They voted against approval on the basis of clinical data. They approved it on the basis of a biomarker, uh, which means some measurement of your, 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 um, your biology, in this case, a PET scan of amyloid, which is one of the substances involved in these age-related processes, but, um, it's, it, 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 but it's not been validated. That's to say, we approved a drug, but we don't know if it works clinically. And we certainly know in the news that uh, we were talking about before we came on, there's more and more evidence that there are safety issues um, with, the, with this drug. Uh, a death was uh, is being investigated uh, 
which is probably, although we don't know for sure, related to the medication. So this is not safe. The, the, the company p- priced it, uh, if you put it all together with all the studies you needed, over $100,000. So there are people who've, who have uh, done calculations that say we'll bankrupt Medicare if we actually give this to as many people as the company wants to. I'm gonna say one last thing. It's actually a relatively small group of people that pushed this through. There are, and they've been, they've been talked about in the media as well, about half a dozen very well-paid consultants who have pushed this through supporting the National Alzheimer's Association. This is the hardest thing to say for me who's worked with these people, particularly locally, but they do great work on care. But this current leadership has been desperate. And, and there was an article in JAMA talking about how they use desperation as an argument, which is not an argument for the approving that the, they've pushed the field into crisis because they pushed uh, something on us that is um, a disaster. I, I would agree. I, I, the, the price tag, the, the ethics, the, I, you know, I, I think the country as a whole has been what I call kind of Googleized, where everyone is paying to play instead of getting down to serving, to truly serving in an ethical fashion. And um, I, I just think it's so sad. Daniel, anything that you want to add to that, that race to the market? Yeah, uh, Peter often references the notion of regulatory capture, and you know this this situation is being investigated by the Inspector General, obviously to investigate the the, the close ties between Biogen and uh, the FDA. And people are asking, you know, the fact that the FDA gets about forty percent of its funding from industry, uh, which it refers to as clients very often, uh, is that the best way to approach a public health uh, regulatory body in this country? Um, or has, uh, has the interest of big business seeped into that and just distorted the whole um, concept of protecting the public health? And I guess the other element that I'll, I'll mention is that immediately when Biogen got this approval uh, in June and priced the drug at $56,000, they also rolled out a website called It's Time We Know. And this is a website that had a uh, quiz, a six question cognitive screening quiz. And no matter how you answered those questions, it would basically uh, push people to infusion sites in their area uh, where they could get aducanumab administered. They also bought a paid ad in the New York Times that looked like an article, but it was this sort of um, anguished story about a woman in her seventies who, you know, you know, the, the sort of textbook story that we hear about people with dementia tugging at the heartstrings and then at the end of that um, linking again to their proprietary website to get people to infusion sites so there's just so much manipulation and um, uh, as you say unethical behavior Lori in this space and um, it it really distorts our sense of collective good or uh, looking out for one another because it's just a race to make huge sums of money um, in, in the most cynical ways possible so it's been really really an embodiment of all the things that we critique in the book. And Danny taught me one word to capture this, um, neoliberalism, which is a hard word, but I think we have to use it more. The idea, you use the word market when you ask Danny the question, it is market fundamentalism. It's the idea that the market private sector will solve all of our problems. And I think uh, that's part of what I said earlier understanding the forces of that in, in, in our society, not only in the dementia space, but elsewhere, is really important for, for our brain health and a healthier society. Can I just do a quick? Uh, go ahead, Elon. So, um, so how do you see, you know, and I, I, I'm willing to risk uh, being, coming across as naive, but, what, but I, I still think it's, 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 it's has, it has value. What, what do you see the role of, of of being of being honest with the public here, you know, being truthful with the public, uh, from from your perspective, tied to public health initiatives. Boy, that's a tough one. I can uh, so I I think truth is is, is being challenged, right? I mean, um, we we have uh, political leadership in this country that uh, that just is not telling the truth, whether it's about COVID vaccines or 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 climate change or whatever. So um, I sometimes summarize my career at this point, you know, at, at, at 72, my job is to speak truth to power and, and identifying where the power sources are and saying, no Alzheimer's Association, you've been promising this for years, you got desperate and you, this is what you've done for 
for people you're supposed to serve. I think Gloria used a good word too, service, you know? This is shifting values and, you know, and thinking about the long term, which is why I turn it now to Danny, who's the future and I'm the past. Well, to quote someone from the past, I remember hearing an interview with John Lennon where he said something to the effect of the world is run by insane people uh, with insane purposes. And I think uh, when you study the Alzheimer's field objectively from the outside as an anthropologist as I am, um, you just see um, how market incentives and am ambition and ego all um, sort of distort people's um, capacity to tell the truth uh, or to just level with, with the public about what we know uh, about what Alzheimer's disease is um, and the capacity to cure or intercede in the disease. And uh, there's just so, so much, um, there's so, there's so much <laughs> negative energy in the field that there is, Peter says, there really is a power in just being honest and telling the truth and trying to, in the most clear eyed way we possibly can, not that we can know everything, just trying to define things as they exist in the world. And that means challenging what we talk about when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. It's not one thing. Uh, it is entangled with aging processes. This is a, a condition that's syndromal, which means it's going to be very, very difficult to cure. In fact, it may require us to cure aging processes. Um, you don't hear that from the Alzheimer's Association because funds don't roll in when they say that. That's a problem. You don't hear that from key opinion leaders because they're getting paid to promote amyloid centric drug mechanism, uh, dr drugs with that mechanism and with single mechanisms. And so, you know, there is a real power right now. We don't care about selling our book, honest to God, I don't care. I've got, but I've got tenure. I'm one, among the most privileged professional class in, in society. I just want to tell the truth and try to um, be as honest as I can, because I think there's uh, some, some uh, honor in that. People are looking for um, authenticity and, and someone they can trust, you know, someone who understands the, the various levels, because most of us out there, you know, we're looking wide eyed and bushy tailed at anything that comes our way. And then, you know, the algorithms, you know, once you click on something, you, you're just, you're going to get pushed that over and over and over and over again. If you really believed it to be true to begin with, it's almost going to just push at you until you know, you do, um, and you're not getting paid, you know, the big guys are paying for those algorithms, you know, to, to work our systems in ways that, you know, we didn't know. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put a plug in for a show. It's a kid's show. It's called Ron's Gone Wrong. And everybody should go see that because it talks about algorithms and how it affects us. And it's the kids don't get the depths, but parents are going to sit there and go, oh, what's going on? But it is a wonderful, wonderful show um, that shows that we truly aren't always picking and making choices that we think we are in control of. And I think that's one of the big problems with today. The other that you didn't mention that I really think needs to be addressed, too, is these bonus packages that people are getting, you know, the, the greed is pushing forward in terms of, you know, making something profitable. And it's, it's personal play versus societal at large, greater good. And, you know, the scales are really, really off, off circuit there. Um, I'd like to know what's going good in the marketplace in terms of brain health. What, what really shows some promise out there because this is a confusing thing for the general public to to believe and even buy into and i think so many with such distrust in media they're just shutting everything down and not listening to so many things so even when someone's speaking the truth a lot of times people aren't hearing it because they just they don't want to get in the middle of it anymore they they don't know how to sort it out so um, let's talk about what, what is working in the brain health market. And, um, Peter, I'm going to throw that to you first, if you don't mind. Well, I'll say one thing that will lead into maybe a comment from Danny. When you say marketplace, of course, you're thinking about perhaps the, um, the, the financial, uh, you know, uh, money, the world of money. Danny, um, works with the farmer's market. And I mean, to me, uh, People getting together, uh, eating locally grown food, food eating, uh, growing it or buying it and eating it. I mean, you know, there's something about human exchange where we do have to 
buy and sell, but it's very different than what um, corporate America has become. But I will say also another thing that binds Danny and I together is a real passion about learning and education. And so my wife and I and others founded three intergenerational public schools in Cleveland where kids and elders go to school together. And some of those elders were paid by patients and Danny's research that had gotten earned in his PhD at Oxford was on that topic. And again, maybe he can elaborate on that and showing that really did benefit. And, and yet, you know, is that part of the conversation of the marketplace? I mean, this is public education. The problem with the marketplace is we've got, you know, private universities and private uh, privatization of, 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 of what's fundamental to being a human being and fundamental to the future of society, which is how we learn together. So I think I, I'll just uh, end by saying that that was a message of, of a dementia-friendly community, another, another topic we might want to talk about. A school, do we think of schools as part of a dementia-friendly uh, community where people with dementia can contribute purpose and joy uh, for them and to the lives and the future elders of future generations by working in, uh, within our case, elementary school kids? So that was a lot. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that we find the sources of hope and the positive energy, because that's what's going to carry us into a future that's a little brighter than what uh, people are trying to portray we are a part of today. Well, you know, one of the things that I like about your, your comment, Peter, is, you know, I asked about Marketplace, which you can look at financial and retail and, you know, what puzzle should I buy? What game should I play? All of those things into the research. But what I kept hearing you say, and what I feel is missing so much is that social connection, that just caring for one another, being inclusive instead of exclusive, um, and how, how that in and of itself impacts how somebody lives with dementia, not only those diagnosed, but their families and eases many, many burdens. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Daniel, for you, are there, are there certain, you know, we hear about, you know, play this brain game and do all of these things. And, you know, what I hear from, from people with dementia, some really believe in those things and others say, that's just not for me. And they're, they like maybe just sit and read in a book or socializing. Is there, is there one answer? Yeah, I think the part of the myth uh, of, of this marketplace of memory is that we can sort of uh, have salvation for our own minds and memories uh, through enlightened self-care. Um, but there's no single product out there that is going to prevent dementia, prevent Alzheimer's disease, even though that's the marketing copy on a lot of these products. And there's been recent crackdowns by the FTC and, the, and even the FDA uh, on some of the excesses of, of marketing. But, you know, there's nutraceuticals, there's supplements, there's brain training, video games and apps, um, you know, and, and uh, the data on these shows that, you know, they don't prevent neurodegenerative illness, um, they may make people better at, you know, a particular function. If a game teaches you how to do one thing, you're going to get better at it. Um, you know, people often ask about things like Sudoku or crossword puzzles as well. And those are all good things to do if you enjoy them. Uh, but I think what we're, we're circling around here, which is great, is the, the value of the protective bonds that bind human beings together. And the fact that when you get a dementia diagnosis that often comes with a social death, that removes people from those protective relationships. And we really have to try to um, restore those, restore a place, a meaningful place for people with dementia. And that's why the intergenerational school has been such a important um, uh, a part of this story for Peter and I. But, you know, to go back to your original question, uh, Lori, you know, the, the things that I've seen in assisted living, um, which make the most profound impact for people living with dementia are things that are aggressively non-profitable, things that don't have business plans around them, like sitting and listening to Mr. Earl, who I mentioned before, tell a story about his past, um, the arts, music, pet therapy, um, dance, um, all of these things. I have my medical students, we're going to start going over to an assisted living home um, uh, near our medical school next week, and we're going to do time slips, which is a creative storytelling activity. And it's something that just po puts the focus on imagination rather than memory and gets people laughing and being spontaneous again. Um, those are things that are not commodifiable. You know, humans have been telling stories for hundreds of thousands of years or tens of thousands of years, at least. We've been painting on cave walls for tens of thousands of years. So getting back to the things that are quintessentially human uh, are really where I see the hope 
And those things exist outside of a market logic. Uh, but that's where quality of life is. That's where meaning and purpose are. And that's where the protective bonds are that are going to really help people living with uh, memory loss. Well, I think, you know, just focusing on hope alone. Um, if someone is, is playing a brain game and it gives them hope, I think that can help them, you know, just from a mental state. I mean, everyone says, uh, and these are people living with dementia, you know, when I'm down in the dumps, my symptoms increase. But when I feel purposeful and hopeful and connected, hey, I'm fending that off. I don't know what's going on, but I, I'm doing okay. And I think that there hasn't been enough value to that. But again, I think part of it is the message is the doom and the gloom instead of the hope. And I know when I entered the space in 2009, that's, that was my mission was to give people hope. I think, I think we can get so much more done together in a hopeful fashion. Um, people, you know, we, we don't um, stagnate creativity in what works and what doesn't work. And I think that's another thing that has, you know, kind of kicked things to the curb and gotten us really, really off kilter. You mentioned the arts and I, I just did a, a program. We're just starting. We did a pilot the other day, but it's called Dementia in the Arts. And it's where people with dementia, um, we do a video uh, like this and they show us their art. And they tell us when they started it and what they do and what they get out of it and how it's how it's perceived by others. And, you know, we talked about doing exhibits and the pros and cons. And it was just, you know, it's so inspiring for anyone who who listens to them. But that's part of the problem. You know, like you were saying, is we have to we have to create a safe, comfortable space for people to have conversations and feel welcomed. And that is no different for any human being. We all want that. And yet someone out there with their little magic wand is saying it's got to be different for a person with dementia. And it really doesn't. We have to adapt that space to meet their needs. But the premise is, is primarily, in, in my opinion, um, the same. Let's go on to the um, echo um, psychosocial model. Peter, and I know that that's a, a term that you coined. So let's talk about this. This is really near and dear to my heart and has been from, from day one. So explain what the heck that is to most people who might not know and, and why you think it's important. So I had to have a, a tendency to make up words. Um, uh, uh, maybe I'll make up one now, but let's talk about that one. So um, eco, of course, comes from ecological. Um, psycho from psychological and um, social from the social. And um, enlightened doctors for some time, led by um, George Engel, for example, have been talking about biopsychosocial models of health. What that says is what you believe, what we all believe here, that yes, health is something about biology and it's something about your individual makeup and psyche and it's something about your relationships, as we've been talking about. Eco changes the word bio uh, to say, uh, as I do tongue in cheek, but not entirely, doctors got the biology wrong. And that you can see that in the Alzheimer's field. It's all about understanding the genes, the reductionistic molecular, single molecule, single profit making drug to treat a single disease, all of which is wrong. Um, and what I also say to bring the word ecological in, as I did when I talked about the farmer's market, the greatest threat to the quality of life of people with dementia is the climate crisis. In fact, for the very reason that you said, Laurie, they're just us with you know, different challenges. And the greatest threat to all of us is the climate crisis in my mind. And doctors need to think about medicine involved embedded in a, a biology, which is ecological, which says the health of my body is part of um, the natural environment that I live in. And that's part of the message in the book. I mean, lead poisoning, air pollution, the quality of our water and our air is an important part of brain health. And we were making progress until people started thinking about too much about magic bullets and they stopped paying attention to the quality of the environments we live in. So eco-psychosocial says to doctors, please take a broad perspective, not only on the psychosocial factors, but on the kind of biology that you practice as a physician. Bring in that public health. Don't just focus on the individual patient and their genes. Well, and I think too, we live in such a, a diverse society 
people have different beliefs in terms of medical treatment and what will work from them from holistic to, you know, to give me that, that magic pill. Um, you had also talked about, you know, focusing on this single disease and it made me kind of chuckle because, you know, everyone refers to it or used to as Alzheimer's disease. Many still do. Many still don't know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. And yet it, this disease is so diversified and so unknown and people diagnosed, I just had a man this morning on one of our uh, video chats saying, and listen, if you get re-diagnosed multiple times, I've been living with it for five years. I've been re-diagnosed four times. That's normal. That's normal because they don't know and symptoms change. And so again, I don't think the general public knows how difficult this is to even pigeonhole. I think of when my mom was first diagnosed, you know, for 10 years, she was told by her doctor, it was hormones. And my mom would say, this ain't my girlfriend's hormones. We talk about this. It's different, but wasn't heard because they were going, you know, on one path and one path only. So I think listening to the voices of those with the disease, their families, and, and then combine everybody, you know, we can't, in my mind, make sustainable change if we are not inclusive. And I think that's how the scales have really gotten off balance is we have not been inclusive of all levels involved in this disease, which is every single one of us in this world, you know, we're going to be touched by dementia. If it's somebody walking down the street or in line um, in a grocery store, it doesn't make any difference. We, we have the ability to react in a positive light versus a negative one. And, and I think that it really needs to be, you know, taken into, taken into consideration. Um, yep. Um, so uh, Peter and Daniel, in a recent interview, you had mentioned uh, that over 40% of, of risk of dementia is modifiable. And I wanna just take us one step back to the wonderful book by uh, Margaret Locke, The Alzheimer's Conundrum, where she basically concludes after interviewing 80 researchers from uh, you know, North America and other countries, uh, um, she basically concludes something you already, you know, you, you preach for years. It's, it's a um, public health and national public health initiative that is based on known uh, what we know, and we know a lot about lifelong risk factors. You know, why is it that uh, African Americans have uh, twice? You know, that's the kind of the common quote. And uh, Hispanic, you know, Hispanics have 1.5 the, the risk of Alzheimer's or vascular dementia. So you know, we kind of know that. We kind of know that. So what can you kind of just uh, share your thoughts about uh, the value? When a society, a society, any society, any any country commits to a national public health initiative that is based on lifelong uh, risk and protective factors. Yeah. Sorry, it was long, but yeah. No, that's a really well-framed question, Elon. And let me just say, Margaret Locke and Elon are two of the people doing the best, some of the best writing in the field right now. Um, that's kind of inspired both Peter and I. Um, but yes, I, and, and this, this will take our conversation out of the marketplace again, because we're talking about state investments at the, for the collective good. And so that, that means we need to think about the 20th century. And we'll go, go back to the, this recent revelation that dementia rates are falling in the United States and five other countries. Why is that? Um, so after the traumas of world, the World Wars and the Great Depression, there were very specific investments made at that time in, in population health. So there were national health systems put into place in many of these countries. Uh, the United States, we've got Medicare and Medicaid, not entirely universal health care, but what that allowed was uh, for frontline care of vascular risk factors. So diabetes, um, uh, high cholesterol, uh, things, things that affect the vascular system affect the brain. And so by by better treating those at the population level, that's one theorized contributor to these lowering dementia rates. Uh, we also had major, uh, majorly effective smoking cessation campaigns, which again is a public health investment. Just in the US alone, we had smoking rates go from 42% in the 1960s to down to 14% in 2019. That's another major input for vascular health and downstream brain health. Uh, Peter mentioned lead. Uh, in the 70s, we were a world leader in the United States, uh, the EPA de-leading gasoline. 
that resulted in um, an 80% drop in blood lead levels in the United States. Uh, it, lead is obviously a neurotoxin. It's a major vascular risk factor as well. Uh, getting that out of our, our environments was a major input for brain health. And then the last one I'll mention is the GI Bill and Pell Grants and the expansion of state universities during the 20th century. This provided education to tens of millions of more people. And we know because of cognitive reserve, this idea that there, there's a buffering effect for people who get more years of education. There some, seems to be something protective about that, that pro, when the state provides education at that level to millions more people, that is another contributor to downstream brain health. And to your, to your point, Elon, I, I will say that something like the GI Bill was not um, doled out in an equitable way at the time because of segregation in the culture and universities and colleges uh, uh, didn't admit uh, black people universally. So that, that we're dealing with the fall, fallout effects of that. Um, obviously, if you're a person of color and living in a poor environment, you're more susceptible to lead poisoning. All of these things in an eco-psychosocial model can help us think in a very uh, systematic way about the things that we know, we absolutely know contribute to brain health for all of us, not just an individual in a marketplace um, playing a brain training game, although that's, that's not a bad thing, but let's, let's think at the 30,000 foot view in terms of uh, public health. And we, we joke that our book isn't a self-help book exactly, it's an other help book, right? That's sort of the, the ethos that we're trying to get people to think uh, about the challenge of Alzheimer's with. Right, and, and you had mentioned in the previous interview uh, the, the, distinct, the distinction between a self-help book and what you actually intended it to be. You used the word the collective, right? Can you just kind of briefly just elaborate on that? What can we do collectively? I don't know if you tie it with government or not, but as a, and I think Peter uh, shared a visit he had at Baycrest Geriatric Center in Toronto. Um, he had a, a certain uh, interaction or experience there that um, kind of uh, crystallized that uh, that dis distinct distinction in terms of what they're doing. Even though I know that Baycrest has one of the best, one of the top five, or at least a few years ago, brain research centers in the world. However, they were missing something there. Maybe you can elaborate on that, Peter or Daniel. So yes, I, I think uh, Laurie Lori brought this very much into the conversation. Everywhere you look at it, it's about connections, it's about collective, it's about collaboration, it's about us, not me. Um, Baycrest um, is an interesting place because they do have a world-class brain research institute, but it's very much psychological. And um, what I kept telling the Baycrest folks is, you wanna learn about brain health, ask your residents, ask your folks with dementia, ask your folks who have lived life who may not be scientists, but they have views about how to stay healthy, particularly in this social collaborative way. So I used to say the brain and the body at Baycrest were a little disconnected, the body being the people they were serving and the, the brain being the scientists. They really had an opportunity to bring them together, which they're still hopefully working on. Yeah, this is, this is so interesting. I actually did a fellowship at Baycrest and I actually asked the entire group of researchers there as how many of you crossed this catwalk and walked into the secure care, dementia care homes and conducted research in those, in those, maybe now they're doing it. But when I was there, it was dead silent in the room. And I know Bakers are doing great work in different areas. I don't wanna, this is not meant to, but, but I asked the question and, and nobody raised a hand. In the last 10 years, how many of you gonna, and then their philosopher, the philosopher approached me afterwards and said, you know, if they will, it will slow their ability to publish and to uh, promote their careers. So I have a lot of respect to Bakers, but, but I also think that there was, there was kind of a symbolic microcosm of a disconnect at the building level, at the campus level. It was stunning to me. More important to publish than publish correctly. <laughs> <laughs> In, in terms of stuff. One thing I want to ask in terms of the following rates, did you guys consider at all, and I, and I think what you mentioned was, was very powerful and makes a lot of sense, but the other side of me says, do you think the rates are falling because there's more awareness and people don't want this and they're not going to the doctor? That's what I hear from families, especially um, more so the men are less likely to go forward than the women to get diagnosed because of the, the stigmas that there is no cure. They, they don't want to be known 
you know, for dementia, they don't want to lose their, their personhood. Do you think that has anything substantial to do with the rates? And I'll throw this to Daniel first and then to Peter. Yeah, no, I think the dynamic you're getting at is, is real. And the stigma that accrues to these diagnoses uh, modifies people's, you know, uh, behavior in terms of seeking out clinical care for sure. However, um, when they pool the data from these six countries, including the United States, the, the dropping rates of dementia risk go back to the 1980s. So each decade, dementia risk has fallen 13% for the cohorts of elders in those decades and 16% for people with Alzheimer's disease. So this is sort of a long-term trend that we're seeing. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the Lancet Commission uh, on Brain Health and, and other researchers who are studying this, including Carol Brain um, and Margaret Locke, are all, you know, kind of circling around this, this framing of it. You have to frame it in terms of the, the material background, the background conditions in the culture that have um, spawned such broad uh, uh, um, trends, you know, across multiple countries. And so, you know, the two factors that I alluded to is better treatment of risk, risk, vascular risk factors and education. Those are, those are across all the six countries uh, as trends. And let me just circle back to Ilan's um, evocation of the word collective, because I think it's important to, again, underscore what happened in the 1970s. Um, and that's um, an, an era, a very pivotal decade when we sort of, um, there was a crisis of stagflation and oil shocks. And, you know, similar to the traumas of the World Wars and the Great Depression, it was a, an opportunity to restructure society. And what happened, what swept in were ideas about kind of free market fundamentalism, as Peter already alluded to, deregulating industries, um, decreasing taxation of the wealthy, stripping away uh, safety nets for people, um, attacking unions. Um, and, and all of those things unleashed market forces, which produced massive wealth, but it, it has unfortunately reversed a lot of the gains that we saw in the 20th century. So whereas we saw gains in vascular health, you know, now six in 10 Americans live with a chronic disease. Um, we've seen falling life expectancy uh, for the last uh, four of the last five years. We lost a whole year and a half last year. Wages have been stagnant for working class folks. It's very hard to eat a Mediterranean diet and exercise when you're just scrapping to get by on, on a you know, precarious working class job. Uh, obviously, the national lead crisis has shifted from gasoline in the 70s to now in our drinking water. Uh, and that's a result of not investing in public health infrastructure, not replacing old pipes that are allowing lead to leach into our, our society, into our, our drinking water. And then the last thing I'll mention is that we're starting to now see uh, falling total years of education for the cohorts that are now growing older. So whereas, you know, from the 80s forward, we saw rising cumulative education. Uh, for the, the, the cohorts that were experiencing falling dementia risk, now less and less people have gotten higher education. And we're worried that that is going to make an impact on dementia rates downstream. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I'd like to get into dementia-friendly communities, Peter. Or Peter, And I know that, that you've done some work with these and um, also maybe putting together your intergenerational you know, concepts um, within those dementia friendly communities. So what in your mind makes a dementia friendly community? I know when we launched the first one in um, 2013, with the help of Lutheran Home Association, people were like, well, you can't do it. You know, it's, it's impossible, you know, and I'm like, well, let's just start. I mean, that's my attitude about everything. <laughs> let's just start and, and be fluid and, and move forward. Um, let's try. I would rather be on my dying bed saying I tried, at least I tried you know, instead of um, trying to craft a mission statement. So Peter, I'd love to hear from you. So two, th two points. Um, one is um, it's a worldwide phenomena. I've had the privilege of visiting them in Europe and in Japan. And what are they that I'm visiting? I think the essential thing is that you have a populace that is aware that there is diversity in people's cognitive abilities and um, that they know how to um, react, uh, and particularly people like first responders and so on, but uh, shopkeepers and basically just the whole community to say, well, if this person is having difficulty making change or if this person is wandering around, you, you, you lend a helping hand, not uh, something that makes the situation worse by frightening that person or taking advantage of them. So it's about knowledge, but it's important it's the right knowledge because 
you know, the Alzheimer's Association uses zombie language, uh, which is, you know, these are these are uh, people that are the living dead walking around our streets at night uh, in, in ways that just uh, uh, counter that message. So the first is is education. I will say another thing, though, and you introduced it when you said life course. I was concerned that the dementia friendly community movement was not linked into the age friendly community movement. You said it, Laura, you don't develop uh, communities for different groups. You know, here's the dementia friendly, here's the stroke friendly, here's the Parkinson's friendly. No, it's friendlier communities. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean just older people. It means children with, uh, with challenge, cognitive challenges or motor challenges. So the, uh, the, the World Health Organization and ARP call them um, communities for all ages. And now we've got to, got to it, right? It's not just dementia, it's just as older people, it's just younger people. It's community life. It's back to these this theme we've been having in this conversation. It's how do we create places that are more fun, more enjoyable, more purposeful for, for all of us to live in? And I'll say one last thing that about a, a community. It's all, it is about spirit, what the mission statement of our intergenerational schools. Often schools are not considered part of uh, dementia or age-friendly age communities because they're thinking of older people, except of course, when you have intergenerational schools. But the mission statement of the intergenerational school is spirited citizenship. And I would love to do a study that says the best thing you can do for your brain health is to engage in community life politically or other ways so that you're serving other people, not just yourself. And um, that is what we desperately need. We, we, we need people to be engaged with others. And um, I usually plug Danny George for president sometime during uh, this conversation. So I might as well. I mean, you know, he, he's, he, he's very articulate and passionate. We need that kind of young leadership in many spaces in society academics as well. When I heard you, Daniel, uh, speaking a minute ago, and I, I was literally about to say it, and now Peter gave me the reason to say it. You know, I'm looking at you, and I, of course, uh, Peter, but I'm looking at you, and I'm, I'm, I wish that this same spirit and vision and words, uh, that you would speak them in Congress. I, I honestly think that it is obviously critically important. And I, I hope that you will find a way to share your vision with lawmakers and, and Congress uh, because they are the people who need to hear that. I appreciate that. I, I, I resent Peter launching my political career, though, because that is the worst thing you can wish on anybody. But no, I, I really appreciate your, your, your comments on that front. And I mean, part of this is telling a different story about dementia and about what it means to be a human who's a part of a community. Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, the gerontocracy in Washington, D.C. could use some new ideas and, uh, you know, different energy, as you say, Elon. So perhaps we'll find a way to do that. But, um, um, yeah, at, at this point, I, uh, I'm unfortunately uh, just the guy who wrote a book. But <laughs> if right, somebody but wanted to give me an audience, I'd be happy to. Right. But things start like that. And you've been you and Peter have done a lot of thinking for many years. And I think that if there's an administration, you know, that, you know I'm thinking about the Biden administration, about, uh, you know, I can see you sitting with him or his, 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 his staff and, and sharing the vision. I mean, I really do. And I really think it's important for that to happen. Um, how to make that happen? I don't know. Can't well, I think we should distribute the link to this program to everybody in, in Congress, right, uh, Lori? Can we do that? Yeah, we can we can push it out there. What the heck? You know, I mean, it's it's so um, it, it's so funny because what we're talking about is being inclusive, serving. And right now, that is, to me, the last thing Congress is doing. They are self-serving. They are um, they, they've pillared themselves apart and it's just protecting territory and not protecting the territory who hired them to be in the positions to begin with. And so, you know, I, I've always had this saying, what's good for dementia is good for all of the world. It's a really, yes. and I think, I think what's so funny with it is so many um, people in organizations want to make it so complicated that no one will question them when really it comes down to simplicity. It comes down to ease. It comes down to being kind. It comes down to, um, offering a hand when somebody needs it, you know, if, if they've got dementia, if they're a young child, they're whatever age, if they're mentally ill, it, it's just really about 
how do you want to be treated and, and treat others like that? And we have totally lost sight of that, the, the vision that it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, and to me, more importantly, and you guys might um, disagree with this, but it doesn't have to be perfect. Just damn it, get out there and start it. Listen to the people, um, analyze things and be fluid and make changes as the needs prove that they need to be changed instead of some equation you have back on your desk saying, this is the projection it's gonna take. We're not always right with our projections and we have to be in the middle and observant and listening to people and so much of what needs to be changed can be changed very easily. You know, we talk about the culture movement and change. And, you know, when, when I go speak with people on this, you know, everybody thinks it has to be big and cumbersome and no one's going to get on board. And it, it really it just starts with a smile. It starts with eye contact. It's, it starts with connecting on very simple levels. And if you can get one or two people to do that, they, it, it adopts it, it changes the room, it changes the conversation. And so uh, again, I, I just, I love the work that you guys are doing. Um, you're taking, you know, this huge amount of, of data, which I know I could never swallow and breaking it down into really simple segments and being very thought provoking in terms of what the world could look like and how do we, how do we turn the ship? How do we get it back on a path? If you can each summarize what you see as being the cracks in our system between political and social and economical, and especially given COVID now, you know, on top of that, Peter, I know that's a big question. So just plug in the holes that you, that come to mind right now. So by cracks, do you mean places that people fall through um, or mm -hmm. because um, I, I'm a big believer you can learn from all kinds of things, including the cracks. So mm -hmm. you can also see cracks as an important place to see where the structure is weak and um, what we need to do to right. change. Right. Very true. Uh, yeah. I, uh, so the metaphor of crack, in fact, there's a play written by my friends in Canada called Crack. Cracks are where the light comes through, I think. Exactly. Is I think Leonard Cohen has a song. And Cohen, but I will say one thing to answer your question. I think it is... Um, a broad view of what public health is all about. A broad view of public, meaning inclusive, meaning social and economic justice and income inequity and addressing the public in a broad way and health in an eco-psychosocial way, not just the health, uh, you know, the number of pills you take. So I would say a big gap, let's call it that, a big chasm is our, in a, and COVID has shown us this, is our inadequate attention to public health. Thank you. Daniel, how about you? Anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I'd stick with COVID for a second, because like aducanumab, I think it embodies a, a lot of what is wrong in this, the way we have structured our society. Um, you know, it, initially, we weren't able to contact trace effectively. That's largely because there's been massive cuts to public health departments, uh, right? We weren't prepared for a pandemic. Um, uh, Long-term care homes were the site of, of, of massive death uh, and suffering, unfortunately. And the worst hit homes were the ones that didn't have unionized workforces, right? People just didn't show up to work. There wasn't PPE on hand. Uh, uh, we also saw a kind of rugged individualism, uh, an inability to collectively orient the culture around any shared goals or uh, strategies, uh, very reminiscent of this era of fractured um, kind of relations and, and fragmented realities. Um, so, you know, where can we plug some of those holes? Well, I think like, as with COVID, we were all hoping that maybe we could extend healthcare to people and that would be a, a way of sort of uh, dulling the impact of, of, the, um, uh, of the pandemic. That didn't happen, but that could clearly help with COVID. It could clearly help with dementia. If we extend healthcare to the 80 million under underinsured people right now, that would better treat vascular risk factors and just project benefits into the future again, uh, you know, I was hoping that we could get a job guarantee and a living wage out of it because obviously that we had massive economic shocks from COVID, um, you know, giving people less precarity in their lives, less stress, less depression, less uh, uh, anxieties that would benefit brain health too. Um, 
again, universal education, just to, to put my political hat on again, uh, that, that Elon and Peter have put on me, you know, we could make education tuition free, higher education, we could provide free vocational training to people. That's something we managed to do in the 20th century. We've lost grasp of that collective goal, that collective investment. Now education is marketized, right? People in, in you know, Zoomers uh, and, and even millennials have gone into hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt because we have Wall Street underwrite our education system. These are just massive problems, um, you know, and then the lead uh, the lead epidemic that, that Peter and I have both mentioned that we've talked about before, we could have uh, a major infrastructure project. Uh, and that's in fact, part of the build back better proposal, or it was, um, you know, we could, we could make those investments in our collective well being again. Um, but we need to start talking about it again. And we need to challenge power, because we basically live in an oligarchy, mm -hmm. functional oligarchy that it's been captured by uh, money interests and corporate interests. And I think that's another thing we have to tell the truth about and be honest about if we're going to make any progress. And we may not make, make progress in our lifetimes or in this decade or in, in, you know, but we have to define the problem correctly uh, and, and help people see the, the true locus of power, the true sources of power that maintain the status quo. Uh, so that's, that's my, my soapbox rant. And I will rest my case for, for president on that, I guess. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I think with COVID too, one of the things that um, kind of came out in those cracks and kind of shined the light was people had compassion and empathy for the isolation they didn't see before. It, and it also ignited a fire under many to want to volunteer to help. And that has not been embraced. And we need, we need to figure out how to harness that before it goes by the wayside again, because so many people want to help. And the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, we've talked a lot about societal good, you know, and being inclusive. And I think one of the things that need to change, and, and Peter, maybe you can come up with a new word, but I think people, people take that and go, it's socialism. And they have a real per perceived idea on what that means and what that looks like when we're really talking about you know, the, the betterment of society as a whole. I think when you work towards the greater good, I don't think you can go wrong. I, I personally really don't. Um, Elon, we've got like four minutes left. So go ahead. I want to just kind of briefly ask you about uh, stigma, about the role of stigma in, in our ability or inability to realize a, a hopeful, uh, and I would emphasize feasible, uh, vision for the future. Okay. Peter, you want to take that first? Well, so I'll, I'll bridge from uh, socialism to that. I mean, look, we, we, socialism is evil, according to some people. I mean, I think the better word is social democracy, but I've answered here, I've answered, that's not, I didn't know that word, but look, Bob Butler was one of my mentors. And when he started the, Na the National Institute of Aging in 1974, he said, we need a disease and he picked Alzheimer's and then he developed what's called the politics of anguish. You have to make people desperate, anxious. I mean, he regretted that later in his career. And he also is someone who said Alzheimer's is not one thing. So he, he kind of got with the program. But politically, he created a monster uh, because as soon as you start fear, desperation, you create stigma. And what I say all the time is, why, do, why does the Alzheimer's Association create all these images and then go out there and say, we want to destigmatize it. Uh, why do they, uh, what I say is, why do we dehumanize people? And then all of a sudden put them into arts programs and music and, and, and try to rehumanize them as if, wait a minute, as Lori said, isn't this what we all want from a community, uh, a place where we can be respected and, and uh, have dignity? So I think, um, yeah, I think you've got to look at where does stigma come from? And it comes from um, people that want to demonize individuals, be they socialists or be they people with dementia. And that reflects back on them uh, in terms of the, the lack of humanity there. I mean, so the, the, some of the forces uh, of stigmatization are really quite malignant. So I, I want to stigmatize the stigmatists. Thank you. Daniel, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think part of telling the truth is helping to demystify what it means to be a person living with dementia. And that gets clouded by all of these tropes and metaphors that kind of uh, frame that, you know, 
the, and, and dramatize that, that process and alienate us from people living with memory loss. And so part of it is challenging those tropes uh, and, and stripping them away and helping us see people living with dementia as people uh, on, a, on a continuum that we're all on. Um, uh, one of our chapters, in fact, is called Occupy the Nursing Home. And I want to pick up on your the, the spirit, Lori, that you're re referencing, which is people want to help. They want to be part of something meaningful. They want to have thick personal bonds with people. That's that's how we've evolved as, as human beings. Um, so yeah, go go to nursing homes, break down those walls. You know, we started in the 90s with person-centered care, then it evolved to relationship-centered care. Now we talk about community-centered care. Let's break down the walls of these institutions. Let's use the arts, let's use our passions and hobbies to connect with people living with memory loss, memory challenges, and let's let's have a less alienated society uh, by virtue of breaking down those walls. Everybody wants to live a good life uh, that's secure and calm and connected with other people. And uh, we just need to strip away a lot of uh, the bad, bad stuff first. <laughs> Right. Right. Well, I think it's an excellent point, and I think Kate Swaffer uh, from Australia is a big leader in the field, as we all know. She uh, had actually the, the, the last piece of the, the 2019 uh, book or revised edition of, of Kitwood's 1997 book, the mentor considered the, uh, the person comes first. She writes about, but with the way to do it is if people with dementia will drive the conversation. And I think that's an important uh, uh, distinction as part of uh, if we're really committed to authentic partnership with people living with dementia, which as, as the phrase goes, nothing, nothing about us without us, right? I agree. But I, I just want to thank you guys so much for being part of the show. This was just really insightful for me. And I, I could talk with you guys all day long. Now you can go to their website, um, americandementia.com. That's americandementia.com. You can get the book, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society on Amazon. They also have a uh, Facebook page, The Myth of Alzheimer's, which was another book. And we have their um, Twitter uh, accounts as well as a link to an article in Psychology Today. So please share this. I think it was a really healthy discussion about what's going on in a different way to, to look at, at what's happening to all of us and how it's affecting the world we live in. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye Diana. now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.